Sometimes the story behind why a movie failed can be as interesting and enlightening as the movie itself, particularly because the reasons movies fail, both commercially and critically, often have more to do with forces outside of the film itself, how it was marketed to the public, what sorts of cultural movements and societal norms were present at the time, general expectations. All of these are things that can make or break a movie just as much as the quality of its content. In the case of the Josie and the Pussycats live action movie, our perceptions of a lot of things made it a critical and commercial commercial failure, but the reasons it failed are more than a little suspicious. Josie and the Pussycats is a 2001 film directed by Harry Elfont and Deborah Kaplan, whose other works include, among other things, a very Brady sequel, and thus the creators of Sure, Dan. The 90s Brady Bunch movies are actually a good little precursor to the style of over-the-top humor in this movie, which is also a simultaneous takedown, deconstruction, and affectionate homage of a well-known, mostly wholesome older property, in this case a subset of Archie Comics characters from the 1960s. That property, Josie and the Pussycats, centered on a group of three girls, Josie, Melody, and Valerie, donning an iconic leopard print uniform with the cartoon, which aired from 1970 to 1973, is probably what most people remember, including the final season where they went into space, because, you know, why not? Despite only lasting 32 episodes, the concept remained more or less recognizable in the cultural consciousness, likely because they were started in Archie Comics, and then the show was rerun ad nauseum in the early days of Cartoon Network in the 90s. But regardless, by the turn of the millennium, the only Archie comic adaptation happening at the time was Sabrina the Teenage Witch, a sitcom that was a more or less wholesome take on the property. There must be somebody out there who's not so stingy with kisses. Oh lord. He's got toilet water breath. Oh. A property which itself was still being considered wholesome and nice in the mainstream audience. An attitude which would continue until, well... Let's not be catty bitches. Mm -hmm. Unlike Sabrina, the Josie and the Pussycats live-action film was pretty definitely not out to be wholesome. It follows an extremely 2001 struggling girl rock band with extremely 2001 hair and fashion who are discovered by a high-profile record producer and rocket to stardom, which of course gets them involved in shenanigans and tests their friendship where they learn that their bond as best friends is more important than fame. I mean, you know, basic stuff. Of course, we've seen plenty of adaptations of beloved properties and pop star rise to stardom movies, both before before and after this one came out, but what sets it apart is what it does with the concept. Not just being an adaptation or a rock star movie, but what its very existence means within the scope of pop culture in general. You're nobody without an Abercrombie and Fitch vintage tea. They're selling stuff through our music. Josie and the Pussycats are the best band ever. They're selling us through our music. I knew there was a reason you were so popular. In the world of Josie, evil corporations run by a fabulous Parker Posey insert subliminal messages into popular media to brainwash teens into buying whatever trends benefit those corporations. This is where it starts. The fads, the fashions, the product placement. I am sick of my Reebok sweats. I need some Puma sweats. I gotta buy a six pack of Zima. Dude, you don't drink. I think I should start. While also making sure they're also buying into the next popular media so those forces can always stay in power. What if they find out about the hidden messages in their music? Ever wonder why so many rock stars die in plane crashes? So, this movie is basically a criticism and parody of its own very existence. As a corporate mandated movie specifically made to latch onto a known brand and exploit it to sell lots and lots of merchandise through lots and lots of cross promotion with other brands. Are you more likely to buy a CD or read a comic? or watch a cartoon, or go and see a movie about a trio of luscious ladies called Juicy and the Pussycats. Well, the very idea is the most unart and unsubversive thing you can ever do. So what the movie does is make that the entire point, and in fact calls out the thinly veiled marketing and brand heavy mentality that's so deeply tied into not just the music industry, but all media in general. We found that subliminal messages work much better in movies. So what we end up seeing is a film that notches up the typical elements of a brand-heavy movie like this up to 11. It's filmed with those flashy, rapid-cut music video styles with an overt MTV aesthetic, exactly what you'd expect from any shallow, heavily marketed teen movie of that era, but exaggerates it to an absurd extent. Lots of random and nonsensical cameos. Hello, 
I'm Eugene Levy, and yes, I'm an actor. No, I said cappuccino. Subliminal messages delivered by the actual movie phone guy. You could have your own primetime TV series and run it right after Will and Grace. Oh my god, that's Mr. Movie Phone. How did you get him to put that on there? <gasps> you slept with him. And Carson Daly playing himself on TRL and then threatening to bash in Terry Reed's head, which is extra weird because they were dating at the time. Yeah, right, like I'd ever go out with a guy like you. And alongside all that is plenty of subtle and not so subtle meta references, as you'd expect. I still don't understand why you're here. I'm here because I was in the comic book. What? Nothing. But at the same time, it calls out the rampant consumerism present in the entities that create movies just like this, almost always at the expense of art and often in ways that exploit youth. It's cool if you like it. It's, it's all right if you don't. Just decide for yourselves. This actually ties into why the movie version of the Pussycats don't play an equivalent to the bubblegum pop from the cartoon, but instead lean more into a pop punk style of rock. As director Deborah Kaplan says, we were coming out of an era with Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Sonic Youth, bands that really encouraged dissent and individuality. It was like the music industry suddenly decided we needed to course correct and feed everybody what we want them to buy and promote corporate culture and not be like down with corporations. It was kind of a reaction to that. In fact, this movie is pretty on point in predicting the fall of boy bands after the 1990s and the rise of pop punk in the early turn of the millennium, as evidenced by the plot literally killing a late 90s-esque boy band Band while having a pop punk girl band rise up afterwards. The titular band was created with vocals by Kay Hanley of Letters to Cleo and features songs written by Adam Duritz of Counting Crows, Jane Wydland of The Go Go's, and Adam Schleisinger of Fountains of Wayne. Quite a pedigree, really, which people did recognize. In fact, the soundtrack album was certified gold within a month and a half of its release, and two decades later, it was even re-released on vinyl. Ultimately, it all seems like a carefully crafted, fairly insightful, and multi-layered setup for any film analyst's dream. Instead, what we got was a movie that people weren't exactly kind to, to say the least. There are movies that are failures, and there are movies that essentially ruin careers, or at least severely hinder them. This film was a certified box office bomb, earning about $15 million against a $39 million budget, and most critics at the time kinda really, really hated it. In fact, the failure of the film at the time was apparently so catastrophic that it singled out as being solely responsible for tanking the career of Rachel Lee Cook, who plays Josie, after having been a rising star throughout the late 90s with films like She's All That. My bet? Am I a fucking bet? Meanwhile, writer directors Harry Alfont and Deborah Kaplan have since said that the intense failure and negative response pushed them to literally never direct a movie ever again. One pretty obvious thing that hurt this film for the general audience is that no one really knew how to market it. The thing is, Josie and the Pussycats doesn't really fit right into a perfect group, and that's something that directors did realize, but way too late. Kaplan has since said, I saw the marketing. It was all pink and purple and juvenile, and there were marketing marketing it to 10 year olds. The people who were supposed to sell this movie didn't understand the movie, nor who it was for, and that's when I realized, oops, nope, no one's going to see this. Unfortunately, they were right. Especially since there was a lot of merchandise for 10 year olds that teens and young adults wouldn't want, but for a movie that definitely isn't made for 10 year olds. There was even an edited for family viewing version of the DVD release, still trying to market the movie towards younger audiences, which is essentially the TV edit of the movie that is very awkwardly censored and thus full of lots and lots of great gems. Lisa, it's me, Wally, Whitehead Wally. So you could go crawling back to Hicksdale? Oh, you big rat. In any case, no one really knew how to take Josie just from the trailers, much less go see it. Couple that with the idea that the wholesome fun and silly pussycats of the comics and cartoons were being what some reviewers considered sexed up, or as one critic put it, wholesome as ice cream cones and as skimpily dressed as Hooters servers. 
Oh yeah, don't worry, we're gonna unpack that later. So it's understandable why this movie probably wasn't destined to be a big financial hit. And for those who did see it, the humor wouldn't be for everyone, and that extra level of metatextualness isn't really everyone's cup of tea either. But still, more than any movie of its kind, everything it's saying or lambasting is blatantly spelled out here, with the world of the film littered with an obscene, cartoonish amount of corporate logos, and it ends with the most useless character in the movie proudly and overdramatically proclaiming a big moral message that no one really particularly cares about. I'm not, I'm not this, I'm not what I wear. I'm not what I wear. Oh, please. Unlike you bunch of whack jobs, I am perfect just as I am. Like, there's not a lot of nuance to this movie, and it's very, very purposeful about it. Does anyone else think it's a little strange that all this happened in a week? Nearly every scene features prominent product placement, and according to the filmmakers in the DVD commentary and in recent interviews, none of it was actually paid for. In fact, according to IMDb, there are logos from a whopping 73 different companies, and that's not accounting for the different variations of those logos and how repeatedly those logos appear. At the very least, it's super obvious what it's doing, right? I will not bow to any sponsor. It's like people only do things because they get paid. According to Rotten Tomatoes, which has archived reviews from the film's 2001 release, the critical consensus is, this live-action update of Josie and the Pussycats offers up bubbly fluffy fun, but the constant appearance of product placements seems rather hypocritical. Oh now come on! Okay, I could see the argument that there is some hypocrisy when the merchandise the movie criticizes is still merchandise that actually existed that the corporation making the movie was making money off of selling. But the critical conversation at the time didn't even go that far. The simple idea that the product placement is a deliberate joke just seemed to fly over critics' heads. I want a Big Mac. What? Mel, you're a vegetarian. I know, but suddenly I want one. With numerous reviews saying things like, what kills the flick is the crass commercialism, and the movie is a mind-numbing montage of fast commercial images, or it contains more product placements than any movie I've ever seen, or it assaults us with an unprecedented barrage of product placement, or, my favorite, I have never seen so much product placement in a movie. Every shot seems filled with at least one endorsement. The movie seems to be against buying into blatant commercialism, but then what are all these things doing in the movie? And that's just a small tidbit of the contemporary reviews that have this exact same very strange misunderstanding. Renowned critic Roger Ebert's one half star review is one of the most revealing ones though, because he seemed to almost admit what the movie was going for, saying the movie is a would-be comedy about prefab bands and commercial sponsorship, which may mean that the movie's own plugs for Coke, Target, Starbucks, Motorola, and Evian are part of the joke, but Josie ignores bountiful opportunities to be a satire of the Spice Girls and other manufactured groups, which of course is despite the fact that the movie literally opens with a satirical look at a manufactured boy band group. Why come my limited edition Coke can has me with a goatee when everybody knows I shaved into a soul patch for the Don't Tell Your Papa video? This isn't about dunking on critics not getting a movie, but it is suspicious that this obvious element consistently flew over each and every one of those professional film critics' heads. Now, in all fairness though, any satire is open for interpretation based on how well its satirical elements are presented, so it's worth diving into what exactly makes makes this a satire in the first place. Satire is a complicated subject, probably one of the more contentious topics in both criticism and comedy, because it's one of the few styles of narrative and genre that sort of require you to know what that style actually is. Satire is defined by the Encyclopedia Britannica as a genre in which vices, follies, abuses, or shortcomings are held up to censure, sometimes with an intent to inspire social reform. The prime example of satire is Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal, a 1729 essay describing the plight of starving beggars in Ireland, and then arguing that the solution is to literally sell and or eat their own children. Come here, I'm gonna eat ya! Of course, it's an extreme hyperbole to showcase the heartless attitudes the upper class has towards the poor, heightening the already existing dehumanization to extreme levels to then reflect that right back. If this is only a couple of levels removed from what you're already doing, then maybe what you're already doing now is bad. We see satire executed with lots of methods, like parody, exaggeration, and juxtaposition, but it's almost always from the angle of essentially accepting a proposed problem or observation about society as truth, and then taking it to its most absurd level to show what might be damaging about it at its core. 
I live for these pink shoes. Yeah, they are so much cooler than our red shoes. You guys, pink is the new red. This is the epicenter of all trends. We turn your world into one giant TV commercial. Conform. Free will is overrated. There is no such place as Area 51. The trouble is that because satire involves presenting that problem or observation as truth, then if the audience doesn't perceive what they're watching as satire, they might accidentally take that movie's presentation of that observation as an endorsement rather than a criticism. Fight Club, for example, has been stated to be a deliberate satire, essentially accepting the character's flawed perspective on being men, and by proxy, our entire culture flawed perspective of what men should be, and then it takes it to its natural conclusion, showing why our knack for associating traditional masculinity with attributes like aggression, violence, and power is ultimately self-destructive. The problem is that the film is very cool and stylish, and frames a lot of the things it's satirizing as cool and stylish too, what with Brad Pitt being super suave in a fuzzy coat, to a point that this movie has since been embraced by the type of men and groups it was trying to satirize in the first place. That then begs the question of whether or not it is is good satire, given that the audience it was intentionally speaking to didn't get it and still took everything at face value. Is it the audience's fault for not getting the nuance, or is it the film's fault for not presenting that nuance better? Those are questions that will be grappled with until the end of time, basically. But it does provide an easy explanation for why critics and some audiences wouldn't understand what Josie and the Pussycats was doing. That maybe its satire was too nuanced, and nuanced satire directed towards teenagers with malleable brains maybe is a great idea. If I don't buy it, everybody's gonna hate me. Totally. And I also want orange shoes. Yeah, orange shoes are so much cooler than these stupid pink shoes. While that might be an explanation for certain audiences not getting it, I don't think that is the situation here, and certainly not what all the reviews and comments seem to be implying. The thing is, this movie is obviously unquestionably satire. They're selling stuff through our music. They're selling us through our music. An absurd comedy that is very obvious about it. Diet Coke's the new Pepsi One. <laughs> They almost literally wink at the camera. The other piece to this puzzle is that there was another over-the-top cynical satire that came out the exact same year, one with a very similar wacky and meta tone, and a plot suggesting that the media was planning world domination. Zoolander. Fashion industry has been behind every major political assassination over the last 200 years. And behind every hit? Male model. So why male models? They do as they're told. That is not true. Yes, it is, Derek. Okay. Now, to be clear, Zoolander didn't get great reviews at the time, but they were better than Josie's. Zoolander also came out two weeks after 9-11, so it wasn't exactly the kind of movie people were looking for. But the big difference is that it was still a movie accepted within the cultural consciousness. Many of its lines and jokes pretty quickly turned into memes that had persisted for years after. What is this? A center for ants? and its stars continued to make numerous successful movies together afterwards. In fact, according to Ben Stiller, Roger Ebert, who gave the film a bad review originally, privately admitted to him years later that he had actually changed his mind, saying the film was funny and apologized to Stiller for going overboard in his review, and it did eventually get a belated sequel, and apparently also an animated film that was comprised of a bunch of animated shorts with the original cast, but it only appeared, like, without fanfare on Netflix UK. The best way to be happy with yourself is through plastic surgery. What? But the point is, Zoolander is generally well-liked, certainly not considered a failure or a bad movie, and it never hurt any of its stars or creators' careers. And, more tellingly, even to people who didn't like the movie, it was pretty clear that it was satirizing the modeling industry and the media, because it was so obviously over the top. Everyone watching the movie saw that it was a joke, and accepted it as a joke. Josie and the Pussycats has been a bit vindicated by history, enough to probably be considered a cult film now, but not until fairly recently. So, the question then remains, why did it still spend most of its last two decades being ignored, despised, and overlooked, with people at the time somehow unable to even comprehend the very obvious joke that was happening in the movie, to the point that it ruined careers, all while its extremely similar brother film didn't suffer that same fate? The Patriarchy! Another part of Ebert's scathing review is that Josie and the Pussycats are as dumb as the Spice Girls, which is dumb enough. In an obvious comparison with the British girl group's 1997 movie, Spice World,
which was met with negative reviews, and to which Ebert had even given the same score. Similarly, a review by the USA Today seemed to be willfully refusing that the satirical use of product placement could be intentional at all, in this case being suspicious of it because it's all spelled correctly? No, seriously. But the most telling thing in that review from USA Today is this quote. It's like Britney Spears calling Christina Aguilera underdressed and overexposed. The three attractive leads are required to be little more than mouth the lyrics mannequins as they model an impressive collection of hanky halters and hip huggers, actually more like crotch huggers these days. Oh boy. In a video entitled Dear Stephanie Meyer, YouTube essayist Lindsay Ellis reevaluates the cultural hatred we all collectively had towards Twilight at the height of its popularity. I am not saying that Twilight deserves to be reevaluated because it was secretly good the whole time, but rather that the level of virulent bile that came to define it and Meyer herself was actually not in proportion to Twilight's badness. Essentially saying that while the series definitely has lots and lots of problems, the sheer rage and pure unbridled vitriol we had towards it, it isn't really justified, and is in fact kinda weird. She argues that it really stems from our culture's strange distaste for teen girl things. Teenagers. Which involves a double standard, where popular bad movies geared towards men or boys like Transformers or multitudes of action movies are usually written off as, hey, it was bad, but at least it was fun, whereas the response to popular bad movies for girls, like Twilight, are often, oh my god, if you go see this movie, you're a complete fucking idiot. Josie is a better and different movie in circumstance than Twilight was, but there is a very interesting through line between the two films' legacies. Like how Twilight was treated with intense vitriol because of the perception that bad things for teenage girls are like extra super duper bad, Josie suffers from the assumption that because it's something marketed towards teen girls, it must be stupid. Think about any time you found yourself kind of enjoying things that fit the teen or tween girl or even just young woman teen girl adjacent mold. Your selfies and snapchats, your pumpkin spice lattes, your soapy teen dramas. You can tell Jesus that the bitch is back. Then your One Directions and yeah, your Twilights. The first instinct is likely that tinge of, ew, you're not supposed to like those things. Those things are dumb and objectively bad, and you're smart and have good taste. And if you do admit you like them, it's because you're doing it ironically, or that it's your guilty pleasure, because we aren't supposed to like things like that. Josie was marketed towards teen girls, mimics movies made for teen girls, and was directed by people who made a teen hit, and starred an actress famous for a huge teen girl movie. But it goes out of the normal teen girl scope and ventures into bigger subjects with a more satirical edge, with darker and weightier implications. Compare that to successful and beloved teen girl comedies and even dark satires like Clueless and Mean Girls and Heathers. While all of those films deal with sometimes very heavy and dark themes, you could argue that they succeeded in the mainstream because their teen girlness is still right at the center. They're about being a teenage girl in high school, dealing with teenage girl things. While they do have incredibly insightful things to say and are fantastic movies, they did basically stay in their lane. Josie has a lot to say about teen culture, but it has more to say about the adults and forces that affect teen culture. It seems like critics and probably some audiences just couldn't get past their predisposed perceptions of what they thought a teen girl movie should be. Of course this couldn't be satirical. It's a movie for dumb teenage girls. Ew, gag me with a spoon. The product placement was like an accident. Math class is hard. Right on, say it, sister. Hence why we have Ebert comparing Josie to Spice World, the only other contemporary movie with a girl band, also perceived as dumb garbage, and why we got multiple reviewers spending time chastising the characters for being as skimpily dressed as Hooters servers and too skanky and just there for sex appeal, all of those same reviewers essentially bending over backwards to avoid any of the consumerist satire, which is literally the entire point of the movie. What's extra frustrating is that beyond the film's criticism of the corporate media machine, it absolutely doesn't trivialize the importance your teenage years have, and how they shape who you become as a person. We do see numerous instances of teens being absurd slaves to pop culture. In fact, one of the scenes Ebert cited as being one he liked was the opening with teens going crazy over a boy band, where the teens are more or less the butt of the joke. I don't want to touch them! I don't care what you want! I don't care where! Yeah, straight up love them. We, you know, like brothers. 
But as the movie progresses, we learn that the teens aren't this way because they're just brain dead and that we should be laughing at them for being vapid, but instead they're framed as victims, being manipulated by greedy, uncaring forces who are targeting them specifically because the teenage mind is so vulnerable. Dude, you don't drink. I think I should start. Note that the only teen character who shows any individuality and cynicism... Well, everybody else seemed to like it. It's just because they're mindless drones who will gobble up anything you tell them is cool. ...is practically lobotomized by the bad guys. While all actual teen characters are always on the sidelines, Parker Posey's Fiona and Alan Cummings' Wyatt are steadily revealed to be people profoundly broken by, and desperately trying to recapture, their teenage years. Come on, girls, sit down, we'll gossip. Ha, 115, I'm three pounds lighter than you. But don't worry about it, I think you look great. So pretty and popular. You don't know what it's like to be teased and ridiculed your whole life. And they spent the entirety of their adult years pretending to be completely different people. I just started talking like that because I thought it would make me more attractive. Burying anything about them that made them unique, all to fit in with elite celebrity culture in hopes of finding fulfillment in superficial popularity and fame. <laughs> despite being miserable the entire time. Plus, how he kept folding his napkin like he's afraid he doesn't have any real friends. Just people who want to use him because he's just a big music guy. Yeah. They never got over the issues they had when they were teenagers, and in a lot of ways are still trapped in arrested development. I'm such a pig. Still trying to pretend to be people they're not because they desperately want to be liked and to be seen as cool and popular. Everybody loves Fiona! She's got the best hair and the most awesome clothes. And she's so thin. I know I want to be just like Fiona. That's the secret message that you wanted to send out? That you're cool? All I ever wanted was to be popular. Tell me, is that so bad? Behind all the corporate satire, the most distilled core of the film is ultimately about perception. How we perceive our own self-worth, how we present ourselves based on that perception, how others perceive us based on that, and how that in turn affects others' self-worth. And the effects of that cycle is one of the biggest problems teens face now, one that's only gotten bigger since the advent of social media long after this movie came out. Which makes it a bit poetic that the movie's biggest problem was how critics and the general audience perceived it, perpetuating the belief that movies ostensibly made for shallow teen girl culture are inherently dumb, even if they're assessing, deconstructing, and calling out the industrial powers that influence that culture and call out the systemic problems they cause. The silver lining here is that we're probably seeing the tide turn a little bit in terms of perception. There's a lot more easy access to niche film criticism, and the general population at least seems to be a bit more open and aware of what films are trying to do, and spreading a movie's praise by word of mouth is much easier. Something like The Shape of Water can be a weird passion project that becomes known as the weird fish sex movie, and yet it can still be a gigantic success, and win Best Picture, mostly because people were open-minded enough to not let their predisposed perceptions of the weird fish sex movie blind them from seeing the artful filmmaking or layered metaphors and messaging about being an outcast, and also were way more open to admitting that the fish guy had a nice butt. The point is that having an open mind about media doesn't mean automatically liking everything or seeing things you know you're going to hate, but it's about more actively managing your expectations and challenging your own notions of what you're watching, and thus being open to, and learning from, a more diverse array of stories. If you don't like it or get it, question why that might be. It's entirely possible that you're letting your own predisposed perceptions stop you from seeing what a movie is trying to convey. Josie and the Pussycats isn't the best or funniest movie of all time, or even the best satire you'll ever see, but it's much better than it needed to be for just being, well, Josie and the Pussycats. Few major franchise movies are willing to take the daring, self-skewering perspective on its respective genre like Josie was, if you're willing to take off your blinders of what you think it's going to be, and see what it actually is. Well, what it actually is is pretty obvious. It actually has something to say. It's cool if you like it. It's it's all right if you don't, just decide for yourselves. These kids will never know what hit them.
And neither will you. I'm sorry, what was that? Huh? What? You just said something. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. I said, these kids will never know what hit them, and then you said, and neither will you. I did? We all heard you. Oh. Well, what I meant to say was, and neither will you guys. Meaning the teenagers? I was just emphasizing my point. Oh, oh, okay, great, thanks. That was close. Excuse me?